Okay, great. Uh, well, welcome everyone. Um, uh, hope you're all well, um, despite hor horrible current circumstances. And it's really impressive that you've all given up some time to um, work on this kind of CPD activity. Um, and thanks very much to uh, Seneca for hosting. Um, you can ask questions in the chat. So I'll, I'll, I'll show some slides for the first bits of the session. Um, but I won't just kind of do that non-stop or stop and we can have some discussion. So if you ask questions in the chat, then I'll try to deal with at least uh, some of them. So the general uh, theme of uh, this morning is metacognition. Um, in a way, you can kind of think of like memory, metacognition and misconceptions as being the, the broader theme. Um, because uh, in terms of what I'm going to talk about, um, it's really focused on what people think about learning. So that idea of thinking about learning, thinking about memory. And I think that um, as a teacher myself, one problem that we face uh, as teachers is that people often believe things about uh, learning that aren't true. or They don't understand their own learning. And sometimes as teachers, we don't necessarily know when something is being learned or not. Um, and these decisions, like the decisions we make um, in the classroom, reflect our beliefs about how learning work, um, about how learning works. And for pupils, they do as well. So if a pupil is at home studying a list of vocabulary or working on, on terminology or studying a text um, or doing spelling words, then they make a decision based on how they think learning works. So if they have gone over something and they feel they understand it, then they may stop studying. And that's based on their perception of whether they have learned it or not. And one of the main things I wanted to talk about to begin with is really the idea that these perceptions of when we have learned and when we haven't learned something are often very flawed. And flawed beliefs about learning will lead to flawed actions and decision making, such as stopping studying when actually more practice would be beneficial, um, or doing review, review work, like going over something with a class or people revising something, at a time that doesn't lead to the best results. So um, I think the idea of, of flawed beliefs about learning um, maybe sounds quite negative, but it, it makes sense if you put it into a broader context. So in human psychology, we have a lot of flawed beliefs generally. Um, if you think about phobias, people believe that something's more harmful than it actually is. If you think about superstition, belief in ghosts, um, you know, uh, irrational, denial of science in lots of different contexts. It's not only the case that people have beliefs that aren't true, but also that it's quite hard to shift those beliefs sometimes. It's quite hard to get them to see what's wrong or to accept evidence to the contrary. So there's that broader context that we don't always know what is the case. And I think memory is particularly tricky because we don't get immediate feedback. You know, most things that you do, if you paint a picture and it looks garbage, you can see that pretty quickly. With memory, we don't know whether we've remembered something until a period of time has passed. And then we can say, sitting in the exam hall, oh dear, I actually didn't remember that when I thought that I did. Um, so uh, the idea that memory is, is unintuitive and that we, when we think about what we learn, we may make mistakes is kind of the, the, the broader idea. Okay, um, so I'll just share something on slides, or attempt to anyway. Uh, hopefully you can see this. Um, does that, is that visible? <laughs> yes, it's working. Hopefully you can see it, thank you. Um, so that's pretty much just what I'm saying um, so far, is that uh, the decisions that we make either as teachers or learners, um, a situation happens such as I got something right in, in a test or my class uh, answered a whole bunch of questions right at the end of the class. Um, and we then process that on the basis of our beliefs and our knowledge. And that can include our beliefs about how memory works. So maybe my class all get their answers right to an activity. And because I believe that that, that means that they've learned, the next action that I take it might be, well, okay, I don't need to touch that again until it's time for exam revision. Um, so that belief about whether learning is permanent or how much practice is necessary is going to um, affect the action. It's going to feed into the actions. And having an accurate um, metacognitive understanding of learning is going to lead to successful actions um, 
and uh, having flawed beliefs is going to lead to less effective actions. And, uh, and the same, of course, goes for the learners themselves. So they make, make poor study decisions. And we know that a lot of the time, many, many learners make pretty poor study decisions. Um, so I'm going to talk, actually, when people, when we talk about metacognition, often we're talking about the pupils thinking about their own learning. But I am going to talk about teachers thinking about learning too, because I think that these two things are really tied together and we see the same kinds of misconceptions. And I think the evidence is very, very closely linked. So as I said at the beginning, I'll talk a little bit about memory, just because that's the context. You know, if you want to understand what misconceptions people have about memory, you need to understand a little bit about memory. Um, the metacognition, um, and then uh, the misconceptions that arise from flawed metacognition about memory. I won't really go into too many of the kind of major myths about how learning, you know, like learning styles and things, but a lot of these are kind of tied together too. If we don't understand how learning works, then we can very easily fall into kind of the trap of myths um, and, uh, you know, about uh, thinking that learning works in a particular way when it doesn't or that I have to study in this way because I've been told I'm a visual learner so I have to highlight everything. And a lot of these again kind of linked to not really understanding how learning actually works. So I think it's probably quite important to um, clarify when I frame this in terms of metacognition, well what do we mean by cognition? Um, cognition is all of our mental processes. So the things that are going on in anyone's mind at a given time, such as thinking, reasoning, problem solving, anything involving taking in information, but also retrieving information from your memory. So I've asked you to think of like, um, where the last uh, country that you went to and when the last time you went abroad was, then you have to retrieve that from your memory and that's a cognitive process of retrieving it. Um, metacognition, on the other hand, is thinking about the thinking. Um, so that could be our beliefs about learning. Um, and I think, you know, when I was a new teacher, it was often presented as a kind of a magic bullet that if we could just get kids to reflect a little bit on their learning, then everything would be good. Um, and, you know, I can understand the benefits of that. If somebody is doing something like maths and you ask them to think about the process, or maybe think about what was the strategy you used last time, um, or to estimate what you think the answer is going to be before you solve it. You know, I can see the benefits of these. But there is one problem too, which is that asking learners to reflect on their own learning, um, to some extent assumes that reflection is going to be accurate, uh, and it may not be. And uh, it's a bit, a, bit of a bit of a tangent, but we do this with teachers as well. So like in terms of um, new teachers, uh, many of you probably were asked to be reflective to reflect on your lessons um, and if you think about it that only really makes sense if you understand how learning works because if we reflect on a lesson and say well i think that the learners like we're all doing pretty well i think they learned that um, then that's you know it did they i mean you know it may not be accurate um, and uh, i think a lot of the time we assume that we can kind of see learning in a lesson when in fact learning is a bit more of a long-term process than that. So in terms of learners themselves and teachers as well, what we don't realize we've made a mistake, what we think learning is happening, but it actually isn't. Um, so I would tend to see metacognition a bit more broadly as really any, meta, any cognitive process uh, reflecting on any other. So you could have beliefs about memory. You could also have memory of, of your beliefs. You could uh, think about, um, uh, language processes or paying attention. Um, so that makes sense. So, you know, like if, if a learner says, for example, if a learner does a task and they get stuck, well, that's a cogn that's cognition. They, they're, they're trying to do the task and maybe failing. But if the learner says, I'm stuck, I don't understand this, that, that's metacognitive because they're thinking about their own thought process. They're thinking about their own progress or their own ability. So anything where learners kind of reflect on their own ability or think ahead to what they're going to do, plan their study, all of these are, are kind of metacognition, uh, metacognitive processes. So some of the main questions then really um, I want to raise and, and think with you. And there'll be a chance, as I say, to I'll, I'll, I'll pause in after a couple more slides and give you a chance to ask questions. Is what are the flawed beliefs about thinking and learning and memory that people have? And why do they have them? 
and what are the implications for schools and for learning. So fairly, fairly broad, but I'll try to keep it um, as specific as I can. Um, I think, as I said, it's worth taking a minute to think about how memory works, um, which clearly is a massive area and I can't talk about all of it. But just in general, um, to have some idea um, of what we mean by memory. I'm really talking about long-term memory here. So if something is going to be permanently stored in our memories, um, then uh, you know, that, that's the sort of thing I'm talking about rather than the kind of working memory or cognitive load type of stuff, you know, which you might look at in other CPD um, experiences. Um, some of this might not be new to you if you've done uh, some of uh, Seneca's courses and such like. Um, but just to be clear, you know, memory is, as a psychologist views it, pretty fundamental to everything we do. We remember our own lives, our own experiences, we remember everything that happens to us. And to say that memory is fundamental to learning doesn't mean that we're advocating rote rehearsal, rote recall of things that we don't understand. Um, understanding is actually pretty fundamental to how memory works. We remember things much better if we understand them. Um, if you can, um, if you want to explain something to a, a learner, it's much better if you can explain first the context so they have something to link it to. And that learner will then be able to remember it better in the future because they'll have more avenues to sort of thinking back and, and more pathways to recalling that information. So memory and understanding are not opposites. They very much link together. The better we understand something, the better we will uh, remember it. Um, just getting a little bit technical, some of you may have seen this before, but um, uh, it's called the forgetting curve. And the idea is that when we forget things, um, the forgetting proceeds quite rapidly at first and slows down in this kind of curve shape. So the time is along the bottom and the percentage retention is up the side. Obviously it's gonna vary a bit the exact percentage depending on what it is what we're learning. Um, but the general pattern is something that we see a lot. Um, so do learners and teachers actually know this? Um, well, the evidence seems to be that they don't. Um, that often we think that learning is relatively permanent, that an inf the information just goes into our memory and it pretty much just stays there. I mean, clearly we do know that forgetting exists, but we're not very good at predicting how much we're going to forget. Um, so if you think about this from a teaching point of view, if we give learners I don't know how many of you use exit passes, I sometimes see teachers use this, where learners have to write maybe the answers to three or four questions at the end of a class. And we use this as a formative strategy. Okay, most people got these three right, but they got this one wrong, so we'll focus on that in the next class. So the implication there is after one hour, we can tell what they've learned and what they haven't learned. And I think the forgetting curve shows that's not really the case. Um, that actually, you can remember something after an hour, but it's then still going to be subject to a lot of forgetting um, after that. A really interesting study that was reported by uh, Veronica Yan and colleagues. Um, they they gave people a list of words and asked them to predict how many they would, how much they would remember after ten minutes. Um, and most people, the average was something like forty percent. So they recognised they would forget some of this list, um, and that's you know that's probably fairly accurate. They asked a different group, uh, they give them the same list, and they asked them, how many of these do you think you'll remember after a year? And the average was also around about 40%. So, what, what, you know, in reality, they probably wouldn't even remember they'd done the task. So what, what I think this shows is that we do acknowledge that forgetting exists, but we're not very good at predicting what we're going to forget and what we're not going to forget. There's a sort of permanence, um, uh, according to some researchers, that learners tend to underestimate forgetting, but they also underestimate practice. They, they expect that what is in my memory now is pretty much gonna stay unchanged. Um, and what this means, a really useful distinction that's made by um, Jan and Bjork and, and colleagues, is that um, we can distinguish between uh, performance and learning. What we see in the short term, and I don't just mean, I don't mean short term memory over a few seconds, but what we can see over like one or two classes is, more relative, more, we can relate this to performance. This is what somebody can do now. Um, but what we really want is learning, something that's retained permanently, and we can distinguish between the two. So a child being able to fill in the exit pass or getting 10 out of 10 on their spelling practice when they're doing that at home, um, he, you know, or perhaps 
cramming for a, an exam and then getting a good mark on that exam is performance related. But it doesn't necessarily mean that something's been permanently learned. And we, and we know this because people often talk about, well, I crammed for that exam and I got an, a good mark, but then you know, by the end of the summer, I couldn't remember any of it. So something that is um, uh, retained over sometimes even days or weeks um, is going to be subject to rapid forgetting if we don't do something to stop that uh, from happening. Um, so we can only really infer learning over a slightly longer period of time. But what we can do is use some strategies that make learning more likely to happen. So avoiding strategies such as very intensive, rapid practice, immediately you know, practicing something again and again within one or two days, and instead do more spaced out practice where we come back to something after you know, a week, a month or more. Um, varying the context of practice, uh, using strategies like retrieval practice where we test somebody again on the information, perhaps in a different context um, after a couple of weeks. Um, so coming back to the metacognition side, um, we might ask people to think about and reflect on their learning just everyday sense. You know, do you understand um, how much did you learn? How, you know, how well are you doing with this topic? And um, the, the kind of point I want to, to make is that teachers and learners often don't really know, or they may think that they know, but they may be wrong. Um, so they may feel that they get it. Um, they may think that they're learning effectively and they, they might actually uh, not. And that's an important question for practice because if we use things like exit, pra exit passes, if we use things like peer assessment where people you know, judge and um, give feedback to their peers on the basis of a, of a short term task, um, if we um, give feedback on the basis of just like one class, um, then often you know, this is underestimating the extent to which forgetting is going to play a role. Um, uh, and we do do this you know, a lot in education. So we ask people, this is something I've <laughs> picked up online, but I've, I've seen things like this in primary schools where uh, kids are asked to reflect on what they know or what they don't know. Uh, what do I need to work on? What do I need to practice? How well do I know this? Um, so these are metacognitive questions. And kids can do that. They can reflect um, in quite an insightful way on what they know and they don't know but they're subject to the same kind of misconceptions as anyone else's. Um, so they're likely to think that because I know it now, that I know it, and that's it. Um, when it comes to older learners, they may be having to take notes independently. They may be having to um, make decisions about uh, what to study and what to, not to study. Um, and often those decisions are gonna be uh, quite flawed. Um, they're going to, uh, think that they've got something because they spent an afternoon working on it and that kind of thing. I can maybe just actually stop there. I was going to come back to a couple of other points, but I could maybe just um, uh, pause if that's okay, Flavia. Yeah. <laughs> just uh, take out any questions. And then I want to just say a couple of other, I've just got a couple more slides to say about um, some of the evidence behind why we think that people tend to misunderstand memory. Um, yes. Are there any questions at this point? If there's right. not, then I'll <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. That was very great. Um, let's do a chat first before I start unmuting everybody. Uh, does anybody have a question for Jonathan? Can you just say yes or me on the chat and then I'll unmute you only because otherwise we'll get a bit crazy on the thing. Uh, while you think about, I do have a question for Jonathan. Oh, actually, somebody does. Sure. Can you see the chat? Um, yeah, so that's a good question. So are they, I, I'm not saying, so I perhaps should have made that clear. I'm not saying that exit tickets and things like that are bad or pointless. I mean, an exit ticket is quite a good thing in a way because you're doing retrieval practice, you're, you're in consolidating, you're asking learners to actively retrieve something from memory. The trouble is to say that um, it's, it's what we judge from that. So um, we can't say that the, the kid knows it that they've learned it just on the basis of that um, it still indicates that they they have taken something in it's better than them not being able to answer it um, but the the important thing is just to recognize that forgetting that's going to occur after that point so i can study i mean i do like the duolingo language learning 
you know, and I feel I know something quite well after I've done like one five minute lesson. Um, but am I still going to remember it the next day? Probably not. So um, it's just what we, it's, it's the judgments that we make on the basis of those exit tickets. It's, pr it's quite good perhaps to, in, to uh, get some feedback on what was successful in the classroom and what wasn't, but we can't assume that they permanently learned it just because they've answered it at the end of the class or that we don't need to revise it. Um, yeah, there's another question from Brett now. How, how does this impact teaching? teaching? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that, um, I'm, actually, I'm gonna come back to that in a minute, Brett, but yeah, you know, what we can actually do um, in terms of what we could say to learners, how we could start building a, a greater metacognitive awareness. So that's a really good question as well. Um, do you think the word learning causes some confusion? Um, yeah, probably. I mean, uh, learning is quite broad, so we could talk about learning as a bit, a bit of a mixed bag of different things. So that's why I sometimes prefer to talk about long-term memory and understanding and these other things and things that like attention and problem solving that have slightly more precise definitions. But, um, um, but a lot of the researchers, when they use learning, they're basically meaning retaining something relatively permanently. Um, in a way that you can then use that information in the future and transfer it to new contexts. Um, how often do we need to retrieve something for it to become permanent? Um, that's, that's a tricky question. Probably a few times. Uh, it depends a little on the information. I mean, occasionally something just hits you and you just retain it. Um, other things you need to practice a lot. So things that don't have an awful lot of meaningful connection to stuff you already know are probably gonna need more repetition. Things that seem fairly abstract. You know, sometimes in a classroom you say, listen, I know this doesn't make an awful lot of sense at first, but we just need to, you just need to accept this is true. And then you'll kind of all fit together later. So in those situations, because there's not much meaningful understanding, um, we probably need to repeat it and retrieve it more. Um, is a uh, distinction between learning the individual context and learning the frameworks to acquire the knowledge. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, basically when I look at long-term memory, I'm looking at it from quite a constructivist point of view in the sense that you have a kind of framework of knowledge and when you take new information and you are connecting in some way to the existing knowledge in a, in a schema. So um, the more meaningful knowledge you have, the better you're going to take in new information. And we can see this because it's much easier for like an advanced university student to read a complex text and take it in than it is for a complete beginner. Your, your prior knowledge really matters. Um, so I think um, we could talk about retrieving like individual facts, but often like in an experimental context, it's a lot artificial because they've deliberately chosen facts that are you know, not connected to anything. Um, in a real classroom context, it is cumulative process but you still need that practice and there'll still be the same kinds of misconceptions um, weekly low stakes testing yeah i mean weekly low stakes testing is good i mean should it be weekly uh weekly is perhaps an easy one to organize um there could be an argument if they're managing it like after like one week and two weeks and three weeks then then you can probably leave it for a couple of months because it becomes a bit too easy um if they just do the same thing every week um but then maybe when you say that you're talking about retrieving different information in which case you could start interleaving some of the old ones into the later weekly testing um in terms of reflection reflections and assessments and summative assessments yeah um yeah i think again just this idea that that we don't generally really understand how memory works so learners may make the uh, may make the assumption that because they got you know 80 90 percent on their assessment that I, i'm good at that i know that stuff um and just to try and build a dialogue where they recognize that actually a lot of that will be forgotten uh, relatively quickly um and even the stuff that they know well will will eventually be um, forgotten or at least very hard for them to retrieve from memory um, without some practice. So you know how things that you know like from your childhood they're not so fresh in your mind or a language that you used to speak and now you've you haven't spoken it for a couple of years it gets rusty. It's still in your memory but it's quite hard to retrieve. Um, Re-language learning focus on speaking enhance understanding and recall. Um, I'd imagine so. Um, <laughs> that's a tricky one. Uh, yeah I think 
speaking tasks and language learning are essentially retrieval tasks a lot of the time because you're usually not doing it scripted. So you're having to retrieve it actually from memory. You're also retrieving the information in new contexts a lot of the time because you're responding to new things and you're putting the words together in new ways. So I think speaking tasks are, are a great retrieval sort of task, a great way of varying the context um, to which you're retrieving things. The only thing I would say again is that often, if I think back to my language learning experience at school, it was often quite quite massed in terms of the practice. So we, um, we don't necessarily um, kind of spread out the practice of, particularly say it was a particular topic, vocabulary about sport or vocabulary about animals. We'd do lots of practice of that in like one or two classes and then we'd move on to something completely different. And some of it naturally would come up again in reading or whatever, um, but there wasn't really a sort of systematic, let's practice this again after a month or something. Um, so that might be worth thinking about. Any studies show that informing students of how they form long-term memories can improve their learning over the long term? Yeah, I mean, I suppose this idea of building metacognitive uh, awareness. Um, I'm trying to think of a specific study that, that shows that. Um, I'll have a think about that. I was just going to actually share, if you don't mind, I'm just going to share a couple of other slides. It's a little bit shorter than what I already talked about. Um, so. Um, it's really just to give a little bit of evidence behind this idea and perhaps relates to the last, last question there that, that, that memory is quite unintuitive. Um, when we um, ask people how memory works, the answers that we get are often quite different from what memory researchers think. So for example, a study by Dan Simons, Chris Chabry, um, asked questions like, is memory like a video camera? And they found that when they surveyed the general public, a very large uh, number of them agreed with statements like this. 63% in this case of the public said, yes, memory's like a video camera. It's a bit like if you've seen the movie Inside Out, the, the little girl's memories are in these little globes inside her head and then they're sort of projected onto a screen when she wants to get them back. So the memory is just kind of recording and then you can just play back. Um, and that's how um, memory is often perceived. But in fact, um, can you see that pop up in front of the slides? Um, uh, if you ask memory researchers, like none of them agreed with this statement. No, no person who actually does research into memory thinks that's how it works. The memory is fundamentally quite intuitive, and there's a whole range of things that people get wrong. And it's not just the general public either. Studies into uh, lawyers, for example, judges, people who work in criminal cases, um, often um, have major misconceptions about how memory works when they're questioning witnesses. And you can probably imagine why that would be a problem. Um, I did a study which looked at this um, in teachers and uh, found that teachers tended to endorse statements about memory that suggest it's, it's, that cramming is a good idea, that repetition should happen as soon as possible, that memory is mainly about getting things in rather than retrieving it. So we're kind of ignoring the evidence and spacing and retrieval practice, that didn't seem to be intuitive. And there also wasn't a relationship between accurate views of memory and years of experience. Um, so looking at like people in the first few years of teaching compared to 20 plus years of teaching, for example, there's no difference. So um, these things don't seem to be self-correcting. Um, we don't sort of gradually or spontaneously figure out how memory works, um, unfortunately. Um, so I suppose then coming back to this point about how learners uh, study, um, do they know how best to study? We might say to kids, I'm sure I've said this to my own kids as well as my own pupils, you know, work hard, study hard. But if they don't actually know how to do it, um, that's potentially um, going to be a problem. Um, some of the more effective approaches that you may have seen recommended, things like spacing out um, their study. And this is not just something we can do in the classroom, but it's also something to recommend um, to pupils that longer study sessions could be split into several shorter ones, for example. Um, active retrieval practice, that they could test themselves, they could test a peer and perhaps varying the context of their learning. So they're getting different context cues by studying in different places and making meaningful links by learning the stuff in different, like meaningful contexts, like reading about it in connection to different topics and so on, perhaps interleaving some of their um, topic learning as well. Um, you probably come across the idea of retrieval practice. If not, it's just the idea that actively retrieving information is a key part of building new memories. So 
memory, as I just said, was not one way. It's not just about getting the input into your memory. That's part of the process, but you have to then build that memory by using the information. We probably all find that as teachers when we um, learn people's names. You know, it's quite hard to learn people's names if you just kind of like read them off the register. But when you're actively sort of retrieving the people's names and, and speaking to them, it helps to build that memory um, quite quickly. And, and actually learning people's names is naturally quite spaced out because we see the pupils, you know, maybe every week or, you know, a few times every week or whatever. Um, if we just saw the pupils a couple of times, um, took in their names passively and then test ourselves on it three months later, I'm sure you could all see that we probably wouldn't do very well in terms of remembering them. Um, but also, and perhaps related to that last question about, you know, what, what studies have shown that this can improve, can be improved in pupils. Um, building a dialogue with pupils and parents about how to understand how learning works. Um, even very young children can talk about metacognition. So a couple of my colleagues did a study where they showed um, uh, children pictures of other children in various different contexts. And one that they showed was kids in the playground. And they said things like, are they learning? And the kids tended to say, no, those kids are not learning. So they would say, well, why not? Uh, and, the, and the children, this is age like five or six, they would say, well, there's no books, there's no teacher, there's no uh, worksheets. Um, so they had this idea that learning only happens indoors and you know, in a classroom setting. So what that shows is they have quite a, a sophisticated idea of what learning is and they can talk about it, but they also have certain misconceptions. So I would think really from an early age to build a dialogue about how we learn. Um, there have been some reviews um, about, um, you know, building metacognitive awareness and most of them seem to suggest that it's good to use the terminology with kids, it's good to start with from an early age, it's good to model it. So you might say, we're doing this practice test because this is how your memory works, because forgetting happens quite rapidly. Um, and rather than doing what I quite often see is schools doing this only when kids start sort of GCSE age. Now we're going to start talking about study skills. But I would say start right from the beginning. You know, I mean, why waste the first, not waste, but you know, why spend the first eight, nine years of schooling and not talking about this and then say, well, now you're 14 or 15 years old. Now we're going to talk about how your memory works. Um, I would suggest that this is a cumulative process and it would be a good idea to talk about it um, from an early age so they start to build a, a sophisticated understanding. Um, uh, so I guess that just just to kind of sum up, really, um, beliefs about memory, a form of metacognition, and I'm just kind of questioning, can we accurately judge things like learning, forgetting, the need for practice? Um, being able to accurately judge these is important for, for teachers and also for the learners um, themselves. There's a nice little quote here from Dunning. You might have heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is the idea that some people, sometimes people are um, too ignorant to realize how ignorant they are. Um, so uh, David Dunning said, we're, we, don't, we tend not to know where the solid land of knowledge ends and slippery sh shores of ignorance begin. And I think this is very much true with learning. It's we don't know if we don't know. And um, when it comes to pupils, they're, not gonna, they're gonna have misconceptions um, if we as the professionals um, don't do something to try and, um, to try and tackle those misconceptions, really. Uh, so um, hopefully that kind of like touches on, on a few of the issues people were raising. Let's see if there's any other questions in the, on the chat. Um. Uh, Jonathan? Yeah, sorry. I have a question before you go back to the chat. Um, because everybody's at home, <laughs> do you have any suggestions of books or podcasts that we can listen or read? that talk about metacognition if you want to know more about it? Uh, for teachers, you mean, or for like parents and the kids? Teachers, I'd say. Well, yeah. yeah. Um, I think the, the EEF report on metacognition was pretty good. Um, that's very accessible. Um, so I can remember it's like maybe about eight pages or something like that. And I had quite a lot of diagrams, so it's not too dense. Um, but it has a lot, you know, a good summary of a lot of the research that's been done on metacognition. I think it um, hopefully fits fairly well with um, what I've said today. Um, 
beyond that, um, I mean, actually, there's quite a few books that talk about um, learning and memory, but there's maybe not as many that talk about metacognition mm. and beliefs about learning. Um, uh, think of yep. any book specifically on metacognition. If I, if I think of one, I'll, I'll, I'll let you yeah, know. Yeah, you share. Uh, I want to say to everybody that at Seneca, we do have a free CPG course that Jonathan wrote all about metacognition. So that's a great starting point if you want to know more about what Jonathan has been saying. And this conversation, you can, I'll share the link. And if Jonathan agrees, I'll share the slides as well. Is that's that okay? Sure yeah. And so, then I'll add the link to the course and the link to Jonathan's contact and Twitter. Uh, so yeah, there are some more questions on the chat now. Um, yeah, somebody was asking about uh, knowledge organizers. And I suppose knowledge organizers can be quite a good metacognitive tool because um, you know, showing, uh, making it visible to the learners like what it is that you're supposed to know. Um, um, in terms of pupils having them, um, <laughs> well, I think there can be a little bit, you see this with, with university students as well, that having the stuff and knowing the stuff is two different things, as your question uh, implies. And that, you know, if you if you have a lot of notes, I certainly always used to find, um, I'm working in a university now, but for most of my career, I worked in a secondary school. And the kids wanted the notes, they wanted the slides, they wanted to take photos of the slides, they would kind of flip through PowerPoints. But that's a different thing from actually having it in your memory. Um, and I think and there, there could potentially be an over-reliance on that. Um, from some pupils um, and perhaps you want to encourage them that yeah it's good to have that as reference but what you want to fundamentally do is be getting them to do things like and recognize the value of doing things like sort of brain dump activities where they have to write it down from memory and then use that and check back to the notes or the knowledge organizers so use it in that kind of um, feedback uh, purpose rather than maybe to sort of read through it or highlight it um, necessarily um, what else? Um, is interleaving a useful model for memory recall? Uh, and it could be overwhelming for students. Yeah, I mean, interleaving um, could be used in various different ways. I mean, one thing you might want to do is interleave examples to kind of compare and contrast. So if you're explaining a new scientific concept, um, let's say you want to like explain how oxbow lakes are created um, and then you might want to show other kinds of lakes so you have a kind of compare and contrast so that's a form of interleaving um, you might also want to interleave practice questions um, so like somebody was asking about the sort of weekly retrieval practice so it might be a good idea to feed in questions from other topics um, so like my daughter's doing maths at the moment um, you know, so she's got like an entire block on trigonometry, just questions about trigonometry. And then there's an entire block on polynomials and it's just questions about polynomials. So actually mixing together some of these questions, firstly, that spaces out the practice and it also helps them to kind of compare and contrast. But you're right, then I've certainly found this as well in the classroom. Kids can sometimes find that overwhelming because they find it very difficult. Um, it's like, well, I haven't looked at that for three weeks. And now you're asking me a question about that and it can be threatening. So I think it, you need to judge the difficulty um, difficulty can be a good thing um, but it can become too much and the same goes for retrieval like yes it's good to retrieve things actually from memory but it's not good if they fail and get discouraged so um, if they're finding the retrieval from memory quite hard then you might want to prompt them um, give them the first letter give them a hint it's better that it's successful even if you need to kind of lead them to the answer um, rather than for them to think you know because another sort of metacognitive belief is I'm rubbish, I'm stupid, I don't know it, I'm going to fail. So you don't want them to have these kind of negative um, views of their own learning. I think kind of on that topic, so it's a little bit of a tangent, but um, you want to encourage um, the, the, the emphasis on memory, partly because it goes away from that. It's not about ability, it's not about, well, you're either good at this or you're bad at it, but it's about practice. It's about, well, if you do this in the right way for the right amount of time and with the right kind of schedule, you will know it and um, anyone can do this it's not something that is only the A grade students are going to do well and there's certainly plenty of evidence that pupils can boost their grades um, by using some of these techniques like interleaving and retrieval practice like classroom based evidence um, so somebody's mentioned the EEF Brits um, 
one of the best forms of improving learning for least investment. Are there any easy wins in classroom practice that you can suggest? Um, I mean, in a way, it is quite an easy win, I think, to start talking to learners about how memory works. I remember speaking to my, because I used to speak, teach a lot of sixth form pupils who were studying for exams and just about to go off to university. And I remember telling them about things like the forgetting curve and spacing effect. And they were just baffled that nobody had mentioned this before. It's like we've been at school for 12 years and nobody mentioned it. Uh, so I, th I think I, I certainly find it helped to give them a bit of the evidence. So it wasn't just believe this because I'm a teacher and I'm the authority, but it was like, well, let's look at some of the um, evidence behind it. Let's look at some of the you know, research that shows how this works um, and perhaps actually try it out. You know, so try out some little classroom experiments is a really good way of getting them to get their heads around um, how things like forgetting actually happen. And it's not terribly time consuming and it can be done in the context of learning a, a task. So if you're doing some vocabulary learning, for example, you could actually turn that into kind of an experiment and say, well, let's let's see what percentage of this we remember tomorrow. Um, so I think starting to talk about it is in a way quite an easy win. And you often find that learners are, um, you know, quite on board with this because if you say well this is a way you can improve your grades and all you need to do is maybe change the timing of what you do or just study in a slightly different way um, then um, I think that, that benefits everybody really um, so yes I would say you know improving their understanding of memory and talking about it making sure that they understand why uh, they're doing this and that they're they have some ownership of it as well um, is there Seneca learning maybe Flavio may want to answer this <laughs> is there a Seneca um, learning module in metacognition? Yeah, we don't have one made specifically for students. What do you think about yours? Do you think, Jonathan, do you think that's only for teachers or could we give that to students as well? Maybe we should think about um, adapting it and doing a yeah. version for, for pupils. Yeah, um, that is a, a good idea. Yeah, we can think about taking the CPD courses and making them longer different version for students because it is important that they know it as well not just yeah. us I, yeah, yeah i agree uh another question yeah. there time for one more yeah time for one more I think really relevant question there about now we're working from home people's are you know how do we check learners understanding it's pretty hard to do um you know from a distance i think um I, I completely understand the frustration that this can cause, you know, because you may have some engaged pupils who are submitting things to you in contact with you and others who are kind of going able and it's pretty difficult to check on them. Um, I think this idea that to, for learners to understand the learning process is, you know, even more important in a way when we talk about independent learning. So that's true of homework, it's true of revision. And in this current situation, it's really, really important that they are actually know how to do things effectively, they know how to self-test, um, they've got some idea of schedule. But it could be worth thinking about in terms of things like, I know everyone's gonna be slightly different with this, but in terms of things like what you set, what tasks you set, um, again, maybe setting a lot of review tasks, setting kind of formative tasks, maybe rather than setting here's the task to do, more kind of set a, <laughs> sorry my dog excited about something uh, setting something that will be more about helping them to identify gaps in their knowledge so they can then say well i don't need to um prioritize this but i need to prioritize that but at the same time like i've pretty much been saying about formative assessment we need to recognize that because they know it now doesn't necessarily mean they're going to know it in six months time so um i think yeah very valuable to build um their understanding of forgetting and the importance of a good shed a good study schedule Okay, I think uh, Zoom has a time limit, so I don't know how much more we can continue. But I think that's been really, really useful, really great. Jonathan, thank you very much. I will be sharing the slides, and uh, this whole thing is being recorded, so we will post that on our Seneca page somewhere, so everybody can access the video as well uh, later, if you want to get back to it. There is a course on Seneca Learning, I'll share the slides, and Jonathan, do you want to give them your Twitter handle or email address if they want to get in touch with you, please? Oh, yeah, I could type it into chat, couldn't I? So it's at JW underscore Firth um, on Twitter. And yeah. uh, there's a link on there to also to um, 